Praise the Lord. We rise right, so up as we pray together. I'm waiting for you to rise up so we can pray together. I want you to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That today the Lord will reach out to you as we study the word of God together. That the word of God will enrich your life. That you'll never be the same again. Open your mouth and pray. Talk to the Lord. That you're coming here. Will enrich your life. Bless you. Turn you around. Do a great, great work of transformation in your life. That the Lord will make his word to penetrate in your life. Reveal his mind, his word, his way unto you. And as he reveals to you the grace to do what is revealing to us to do, that the Lord will give that to you. And the cleansing power in the world will so cleanse you, so wash you, so purge and purify you. Make you ready for the coming of the Lord. That the same experience of conversion, salvation, purification, sanctification and holiness... We're seeing the church of the Thessalonians that that same experience will come to you. You live the life that a child of God ought to live in the private as well as in the public. And his truth will set you free. Free from sin. And free from everything that is evil. Everything contrary to the will of God. He has the power to do that. And also allow him to work in your heart, in your life. The Lord will do that. His word converts. His word transforms life. His word changes life. Pray that that word will change your life. Turn you around. You'll never, never be the same again. And when persecution comes, because of the word, the grace to go through, and the grace to live, like you ought to live, 
in the midst of severe persecution. The Lord will grant you that grace and you'll abide in this experience of salvation forever. And pray that the beauty of holiness be revealed in your life, visible for everybody to see and the people around you will take knowledge as you have been with the Lord when you see your life your character your conduct you will see the effect and the impact of the word in your life if you're married your family will see it. Your wife will see. Your husband will see. If you're not married, your neighbors will see. That salvation truly changes life. And salvation makes us new creatures in Christ. Tell the Lord that shall not come to the Bible study in vain. That you not do it like the Pharisees read the Bible and never got anything out of it. That the newness of life in the world will come to you. Make you a new creature. Make a great impact in your life. Great influence in your life. And through that, you too will make a great impact, have a mighty influence in the lives of other people too around you. By the word, you can do it. He's done it for many other people. He can do it for you. If any man be in Christ and be in the word, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Pray that heaven will affirm and confirm that newness of life in your experience. And you yourself, your conscience will be a witness what a new thing the Lord has done. Turn your life around, changing your life, bringing the experience of real saints of God into your life. He can, he will. Surrender your life to the Lord. And pray that the study of today will reproduce in you the life that we see, that we read about. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Heavenly Father, how we thank you today. How we thank you for your word. How we thank you for your mercy and for your love that brings us together every Monday like this, together with other people. Lord, we pray that today as we look at your word, you grant us inspiration, illumination in the word. 
that you illumine the word and shine upon the word in every heart in Jesus' name. I will pray that this word will not leave us where it found us. That it will move us forward in the path of righteousness, in the way of holiness, and in the highway of sanctification in Jesus' name. That our hearts, our minds, our soul, our spirit, everything within us will be touched and transformed by your word, even tonight in Jesus' name. Do something unforgettable in every life as we study the word. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. You can sit down. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2. Today we're looking at verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. And I'm starting from verse 13. It says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. For this cause, for this reason also, thank we God without ceasing. Stop there for a moment. Paul the Apostle had been rejoicing on this church. In fact, he called them his joy. And it's crowned. Look at verse 19. For what is a hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are ye are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And you can tell from the real tone in the whole epistle. From the very first chapter to the end of the, for the, end of the, of the epistle. You can see the joy. And you can see the rejoicing that he had concerning them. And you'll see over here in verse 13, it says, For this reason, because of what I see among you, what I see within you, and because of the reports I hear concerning you, I'm rejoicing and I'm thanking God without ceasing. How many times did Paul the Apostle actually thank the Lord for this church in Thessalonica? Look at chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. We thank, we give thanks to God always, always without ceasing. The same thing is saying over here every time, every moment, every day, whenever I remember you, without ceasing, always, I'm giving thanks for you. For, for you all making mention of you in my prayers. Why well, was he thanking God for them? Look at verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. It says there are three things I'm thanking God for on your behalf. Number one is your work of faith. You have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it is visible. We can see the result of that, and we can see the outcome of that. We can see what you have produced in your life. Number one, salvation. It has produced a consistent work with the Lord. And not only that, their service unto the Lord. So winning. They were winning souls to the Lord because of their faith. Not only that, their consistent sincerity in the Lord. They were sincere as they followed the Lord, their salvation, their service, their sincerity. As they followed the Lord, and he said, as I see that outcome of faith, as I see that product of faith, as I see that work of faith, I'm thanking God for you every time. And then you say for your patience of hope. That you have hope in the Lord that he is coming. And because you are patient, tribulation is there, trial is there, trouble is there, persecution is there. And in all your trials and troubles and trauma and trouble, you're just hoping the Lord. And because of that patience, I'm thanking the Lord for you. And I'm praising the Lord for you because you have hope in your persecution. You have hope in your trouble. You have hope in everything that you are going through. Number three, you said because of your labor of love. You are bestowing hospitality on other people, helping other people, giving to other people, remembering the needs of other people. And it says, because of these three things, I'm full of thanks concerning you. I want you to look at chapter 3 and verse 7. The reason why I was thanking God for them, chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. He said, we just got a report from Timothy when he came back from you, that you remember us, that you love us, that you hold us in high esteem, that you appreciate the work of labor, the labor of work, and of the love of God within us, passing on to you, and because of your remembering us every time like that, we are just giving thanks. 
words concerning you. Look at chapter 4. I'm looking at verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. It says, when I see what we have taught you, and you've gone beyond what we taught you, you obeyed everything we told you, and then you went beyond that. It's like you were taught by God yourself. And because you are taught by God, that teaching has become visible that you say you love one another. Look at verse 10, and it says in verse 10, and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. He said, you are impartial in your love. He said, you are not a restricted in your love. There's no interruption in your love. You do it every time. You do it all the places. You do it with Macedonians. All of them. And I says, we beseech you, brethren, that she increase more and more. It tells us in chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 16, it said, you know what, Thessalonians? What I'm doing concerning you, you do that too for other people. I'm giving thanks without ceasing concerning you. And you need to give thanks always. I'm rejoicing because of you need to rejoice always to you. You see that as we came to Tesnaika and then we saw you and we shared the gospel with you we rejoiced. And then as we had reports about what God is doing in your life and through your life, we're giving thanks for you. He said, do that as well. Look at verse 16. Rejoice evermore. I rejoice. You rejoice. We who have come to pray to you, we're rejoicing. You too, whatever condition you find yourself, rejoice. And then in verse 17, pray without ceasing. He said, that's what we leaders are doing. That's what we ministers are doing. I'm passing that onto you. Do that as well. And then in verse 18, everything give thanks. In everything, give thanks. When it's sunshine, give thanks. When it's raining, give thanks. When it's cloudy, give thanks. And when some trials are there to strengthen your spiritual muscle, give thanks. And when some people are coming to the Lord, they are, they are born again, give thanks. And when other people are backsliding, can I give thanks for that? Yes, I can give thanks. I told Lord, you have kept me. I'm still standing when other people are falling down. In everything, wherever you find yourself, whatever condition, give thanks. It says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He gave thanks. He passed that on to those ten, Thessalonians believers that give thanks as well. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 3. We are bound to thank God God always for you. See that again. He wrote the first epistle. He said, you know, Testament believers, I'm just thanking God for you. And then he wrote the second time. He said, I'm giving thanks for you every time. Let me ask you a question. If you were part of the Testament church, will you decrease the thanksgiving of Paul the apostle or will you increase it? Will you look at your life among the believers in Thessalonica and say, I'm thanking God for you. You show the evidence of salvation. You so show the evidence of sincerity. You show the evidence of having real conversion, the power of God working in your life. And so for you, among the Thessalonica believers, I'm giving thanks for you as well. Or will he be saying, I'm sorry that you are there. I'm sorry that you are like you are. I'm sorry that you're decreasing the joy of the minister. And you're decreasing the thanksgiving of the minister because he cannot give thanks for you as he did for all other people. Let's come back to the term believers. It says in verse 3, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, suitable, because that your faith grows exceedingly. He has spoken about their work of faith. He said, I see that increasing. I see that growing. He has spoken about their love. I see that growing. Your charity. I see that growing. He has spoken about their patience of hope. He said, I see that growing. Every time I think about that church in Thessalonica, I see the growth. And because of that, was full of thanks. He said, your faith grows exceedingly. And the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. It isn't that they didn't have any trouble, of course, they had their sheer persecution and trouble. And through it all and in it all, the stood firm, I pray you'll stand firm. 
And then we will be able to give thanks concerning you because you're saved. And because to show the evidence of salvation. And you pass that salvation on to all the people too. As we have read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, from verse 13, the response of those ten believers to the word of God was commendable. It was encouraging. It was thankworthy. That's why he said, when you receive the word of God, which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. They knew that the gospel was not of human origin. Because of that, they gave some respect, some honor, yieldedness, submission to that word. They said, this is not just Paul, this is not just Silas, and this is not just Timothy. This is revelation coming from heaven. And because they knew it is not the word of man having human origin, human source, because of that, they knew that it's coming from heaven, divine revelation. That's why they received it like that, embracing God's word as the infallible truth from heaven. They gave them, themselves unto it, and they had this faith that could stand, and the faith that could stand every temptation and trial. Then he says, the word in verse 13, which worketh also in you that believe. Their conviction on the word led them to forsake and abandon their sins. Forsake and abandon their idols and then to consecrate and devote themselves to God. And then also to live pure, holy, saintly, sanctified lives and to gracefully endure and overcome trials and temptations of life notice that word gracefully endure you know you can have trial and then you can endure grit your teeth together and all wrought up within and so unhappy almost crying almost knocking your fist on the bench every time oh god why should this happen although you don't backslide although you're still in the church although you remain there but you're not gracefully bearing gracefully enduring gracefully withstanding but in the case of these thousand believers they gracefully endured all the persecution that came to them all the trials and the temptations of life the power of the gospel they received the power of the gospel they believed strengthened them to courageously meet all the terrors of bitter persecution without shrinking and without drawing back today we have the whole bible the Holy Bible, the complete word of God. And it is God's revelation. The Bible says every word, every jot, every title, every part of this word is given by God's inspiration. All scripture is inspired of God. That means God breathes. He breathes it out. In fact, Jesus said, Very least I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one title shall in no wise pass from the Lord till all be fulfilled. What Jesus said about the word is, it's not just the words that are inspired. Every word is inspired. It's not just the sentences that are inspired. Every sentence is inspired. He said, every judge is inspired. He said, every teacher is inspired. Uh, you don't understand that word teacher. That word teacher just means, if you write an E, capital E, and then you drop the little stroke, Underneath that E, it becomes an F. It says, even that little stroke, that's the title, is inspired. When you think about that, that means every part of the word, every cross of a T, every dot of an I, every little bar or every little stroke of an E, of an F that makes it an E, everything is totally inspired. That means then the Bible is inspired from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. And as you come before that word, you come like the Thessalonian believers came with respect and honor, with faith, conviction, as you come to that word. That's what we are studying today. We're coming back to First Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading now from verse 13. We're looking at verse 13, verse 14, verse 15, and verse 16 today. First Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God which ye had of us, ye received it not as the word of man, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. For ye brethren became followers of God 
followers of the churches of God, which is in Judea and in Christ, which in Judea and in Christ Jesus. Then it says, for ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Verse 15, who both killed the Lord Jesus, very serious sin, and their own prophets, terrible and have persecuted us and they please not God and they are contrary to all men that is uh, contrary to the salvation of all men contrary to the uh, worship of all men contrary to uh, people coming to the kingdom they stood in the gate in the way hindering people coming to the kingdom of God and he said they were contrary to the eternal destiny of all men in verse 16 forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sin all the way for the wrath is Come upon them, how? To the uttermost. We're dividing the story to three parts. Number one, number one, perfect foundation for the conversion and sanctification of the redeemed. Perfect foundation. If you're going to have real, genuine conversion, you need a foundation on that. And that's what helped the thousand believers. They are the foundation for their conversion. They are the, the foundation for their lives. They are the a, a foundation for their sanctification. They are the foundation for the kind of life they live. You know, some people that try to live the Christian life, but there's no foundation. And if the foundations be destroyed, what will the righteous do? But it is when you have a foundation for your conversion, foundation for your sanctification, that's when the storms of life may come, the challenges may come, but you'll be able to stand because there is a foundation for that Christian experience. Point number two, persevering faithfulness to Christ while suffering for righteousness. They suffered like no other person suffered. They suffered like no other church suffered. They suffered like no other neighbor suffered. But all the same, they knew who they had believed. They knew what they had believed. And they knew what they were standing for. Because of that, they had persevering faithfulness unto Christ. In the midst of all the persecution, they went through for righteousness sake. Number three, the persecutor's full cup of sin and retribution. Little drops of water make a mighty ocean. Little drops of water will make a full cup one day. A drop today, a drop tomorrow, it doesn't appear to be much. Another drop doesn't appear to be much, but keep on dropping it, dropping it and drop. One day it will be full. And that's what happened to these people over here. Little drops of sin and little drops of evil, little drops of wickedness. One day their cup became full. And these persecutors had the full cup of sinning and the restribution. That is the judgment that came eventually. I pray that before your cup is full, you turn around, you repent, have the mercy of God, have salvation, a change of life, and then heaven will be available for you. Give me a good, good amen. amen. I come to point number one, perfect foundation for their conversion and sanctification. Let's look at second, first Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13. What's the foundation? The foundation they had was the word of God. Look at this. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which he, which he had of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. God, which worketh effectually also in you that believe. That was the foundation, the word of God. And you know, if we're going to have any conversion that is genuine, any conversion that is coming from heaven, any conversion that is dependable, any conversion that will take us to heaven, it has to be based on the foundation of the word of God. And if we're going to have any sanctification that is real, sanctification that is genuine, Sanctification that makes, brings a change in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul. Sanctification that is internal, inward, and then flows out. It's going to be based on the word of God. The foundation of the word that makes the sanctification real, genuine. We're looking at this in James chapter 1 verse 18. 
James chapter 1, we're looking at verse 18. It says, Of his own will begat he us, but with the word of truth. That's the foundation. If we're going to be born again, begotten, of his own will begat he us, then he says, With the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. It's reminding us then that if we're going to, if you say you have salvation, is it based on the word? I hope. It's not on just mental assent. Other people say they are saved, so I say I'm saved. They have been talking about it for a long time, so I say, eventually I say, then I'm saved. It must be based on the word, the foundation of the word. That you know that you have repented according to the word. I know you have looked on Jesus Christ as your substitute, as your savior. As your sin bearer, according to the word of God, that you believe that Jesus died for you, even you, according to the word of God, and that he rose again for your justification to make you a new creature and give you justification, regeneration. It is that basis, it is that foundation of the word of God that makes that salvation genuine repentance from sin and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter, I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 23. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God. You see that again? The foundation of our salvation, the foundation of our conversion, the foundation of our regeneration, the foundation of our forgiveness, the foundation of this ticket of salvation that gets us to heaven, that foundation is the word of God. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. I'm reading verse 16. Romans chapter 1. We're looking at verse 16. The foundation of the word that gives you the assurance you are born again. That gives the evidence that you are born again. That makes you to know on the basis of the word that Jesus came to this world to die for sinners of whom I am one. And I believe that. And because I confess that, according to that word, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. According to that word, I know I'm saved. I know I'm born again. It has a foundation on the word of God. Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel that's the good news of the message of salvation coming from Christ through the grace of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see in all these verses of scripture that the conversion is always on, on the basis of the word. The salvation is always on the basis of the word. The regeneration, the new life is always on the basis of the word. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that we believe that brings us real salvation. We're looking at Psalm 19. I'm reading from verse 7. Psalm 19 verse 7. Conversion on the basis of the word. Conversion on the foundation of the word. We're looking at Psalm 19, looking at verse 7 there. Psalm 19, verse 7. It says, the law of the Lord is what? Is perfect. What does it do? Converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. And that, that's what brings conversion. The word of God. And nobody can just, you know, say, I'm converted, I'm born again. I, I will say, on what basis? I, I just feel it. I just know it. It goes beyond that. It has to be on the word of God. That's why those of us who are soul winners, those of us who are evangelists, those of us who go out to bring sinners to the Lord, we must lay that foundation very clearly and very strong so that the people know the word that brings salvation unto them. We're looking at Psalm 119. After we're born again, how do we live the Christian life? After we're born again, how do we live a consistent life, a righteous life, a holy life, a pure life, a life above reproach, a life without reproach. It's by the word again. Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 9. 119 verse 9. Where with that shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to what? According to thy word. How do you remain clean? Remain pure? Remain righteous? Remain holy? 
by taking heed according to thy word. With my whole heart advise sought thee, verse 10. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Again, thy commandments, thy word, thy commandments, the same thing. Let me not wander from that. And then in verse 11, thy word have I hid in my heart. Tell me the rest. That I might not sin against thee. After we are born again, the Bible says, Whosoever is born of God does not, tell me, does not commit sin. How will that happen? By taking heed according to the word of the Lord. By having the word in your heart. By having the word in your mind. By having the word in your spirit. And any other thing you hear from any other person, you compare it with the word. And if he doesn't go along with the word, if he doesn't entirely agree with the word, say, no, that cannot be. I cannot follow that because I'm born again by the word. I'm kept in the kingdom by the word. I'm kept in salvation by the word. I'm kept in righteousness and holiness by the word. Any other word you hear that will make you unholy, make you unrighteous, make you disobedient, make you rebellious, you know, I cannot do that. I cannot do that because my life must be based on the word of God. I pray the Lord will help you. We're spoken about salvation based on the word. Look at sanctification based on the word. You know, there are some people that say they don't believe sanctification. Can you blame them? They don't read the word. They don't study the word. They don't understand the word. They don't believe the word. And if somebody is not reading the word, that's the foundation of sanctification. If somebody is not believing the word of God, that's the basis of the foundation of sanctification. And if somebody is not studying it in depth to know this is the provision of the Lord for his own children, how can he believe sanctification? Because sanctification is based on the foundation of the word of God. We're looking at John chapter 17, verse 17. John chapter 17, we're looking at verse 17. To get sanctified, we need to know the word, read the word, study the word, believe the word, meditate on the word, accept the word. Like the Thessalonians accepted the word, that's how you're going to be sanctified, made holy. We're looking at John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them through what? Through thy truth, thy word is truth, is the word. In Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, we're looking at verse 25. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Sanctification on the foundation of the word. The foundation of the word. In um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that she might sanctify and cleanse it. What's next? By the washing of water by the word. Sanctification is on the foundation of the word. By the washing of water by the word. The word of God. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 13 there. It says, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren. Because... Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you unto salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of what? Of the truth. Belief of the truth. The word of God. The truth of the word of God. That's how we get that sanctification. And I pray the Lord will do it for us in Jesus' name. The Thessalonian believers receive the word of God with a proper attitude. And it became a proper foundation for their faith. Their faith brought the divine power that worked effectually and effectively in them. The revelation came with inspiration through the spoken word. And God granted them understanding and illumination. They believed in the infallibility of the word. They said whatever God says in the word is true. It's real. It's unchangeable. It's infallible. It has no error. And because of that, they exalted that word above any other thing they hear from any other person. And because of that, none of them tried to modify the word of God, thinking they are wiser than God. Nobody did that. They just accepted the word the way it was. And they believed the word in its final authority, fullness of authority. Whatever God said was final. And none of them rated their poets greater than God, their philosophers greater than God, their scientists greater than God, their kings 
or any other man greater than God, they, not, none of them rated any of their big men, great men, educated men, elites greater than God. Their attitude was, if God says it, I must obey it. Even if no other person is doing it. They knew that the divine revelation is higher than common sense. As the heavens are higher than the earth, the truth of God transcends common sense or human prudence, human wisdom. They believed in the sufficiency of God's word. And no one held God's word plus idol. They threw away the idols. They didn't hold God's word plus denominational tradition. You know, there are some churches that do that. They hold the Bible on one hand. They hold their tradition on the other hand. And they even put on equal basis the tradition and the Bible. And whenever there's any contradiction, any difference, they hold, they hold on. They lean towards their tradition. And that thing they add to the word of God will take them away from the kingdom of God. Some of some people, they believe the Bible. Yes, we believe the Bible. And they also believe also in human ideology. And then they join that together. That's going to take the effect and the power of the word away from such a person. But these eternal believers, what they had was a great foundation, a strong foundation. And that foundation kept them stable and steadfast and solid. I pray that the foundation of the word will keep you steadfast. Keep you stable. And keep you solid in the Lord in Jesus' name. Before I go to point number two, I want to just tell you. There's some people that try to have some blessings, but it doesn't have foundation in the world. They try to get healing, healing without foundation. You know what happens? The wind will blow. The symptoms will come again. And because that healing has no foundation, they're swept up their feet. And they say that they have lost their healing. Other people, they have deliverance without foundation. There's no foundation on the word of God. And because there is no foundation... They didn't teach them the word. They didn't know the word. They didn't know where the promises of deliverance were. Somebody just prayed for them and they had deliverance without foundation. And because there's no foundation, attacks might come again, affliction might come again, temptation might come again, dreams might come again. And because there's no foundation, they lose what they think they have got. There are some people that have got a kind of ministry that has no foundation. I had a dream. God spoke to me. I'm starting ministry. There's no foundation in the word of God. And because there's no foundation, that means it's swept away. Some people try to have what they call revival. They say, we're having a revival. And this is happening and that is happening. A mighty revival. Revival without foundation. And because there's no foundation to that revival, it's not based on the word of God. It's not based on the prophetic word of God. It's not based on the promise of God. It's not based on the precepts of God. And because there's no foundation to that revival, whatever comes, a little problem comes and everything is cut and swept away. What I'm telling you is that whatever you say you are having, let there be a foundation there. Have you noticed that some people have decisions without foundation? They just wake up in the morning. That's what I'm going to do now. And there's no foundation on the word of God. And because there's no foundation to that decision, when trials come, when tests come, all that decision will be swept away. Some people have conviction without foundation. And they just say, that's my conviction. That's my conviction. Wait a minute. When trials will come, when difficulties will come, all that conviction will be swept away. You must have foundation for everything you say, you stand on, you believe in. We're looking at Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, I'm reading there from verse 49. But she that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. And that's why you find some people that say they are born again, no foundation. They have experience, no foundation. They have some spirituality, no foundation. Sanctification, no foundation. Holy Ghost baptism, no foundation. Deliverance, no foundation. And because there's no foundation, everything is swept away. I pray that you'll stay and you'll stand in Jesus' name. We're looking at point number two, persevering faithfulness to Christ while suffering persecution while suffering for righteousness, persevering faithfulness to Christ. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. In verse 14 it says, For ye brethren, 
became followers of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. This believer suffered persecution, but thank God is stood, and thank God we are going to stand. I said, thank God we are going to stand. Now, you know, sometimes when you are not expecting something, and the thing comes suddenly, and it takes you by surprise, and takes you unawares. That's why some people give up the faith. They never knew. Nobody told them that this new way, this new life, this conversion, and this road that leads to heaven, that is narrow. And sometimes it can be rough. And sometimes persecution can come. And because nobody told them when it comes, it takes them unawares by surprise. And then they fall. I pray you'll not fall. But if you'll not fall, you must know that persecution will come. And when it comes, you will stand. I said you will stand. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm looking at verse 12. Yeah. And all that will live godly. How many people? How many people? all. If you are born again, it's coming. If you are a child of God, it's coming. If you are living godly, it's coming. Get ready. And it says, yes, yea. And all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou. You know what he's saying? He said, persecution is there, continue thou. Trials are there, continue thou. Temptations are there, continue thou. Opposition will come, continue thou. Suffering will come, continue thou. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. I will continue. I said I will continue. In fact, you know, these believers, the moment they even had the word of God, it was a great, great battle. When they, when they were saved, look at First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. And ye became followers of us and of the, and of the Lord, having received the word in what? Much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. The time they had the God, it wasn't easy, but he said, We're going to get saved anyhow. Satan fought, was he going to get saved? Persecutors came, were still going to get saved. Some people tried to hinder them. No way. We're not going to allow you to get into the kingdom. And we Jews want to remain in the tradition of the Jews. They said, no way. We're still going to get saved. And the people, when they got saved at that time, in the, in the midst of much affliction, and after they were saved, the persecution continued, and they, also, they said, devil, do your worst. We're going to continue in the kingdom. And if you can say that to the devil, and say, Satan, whatever you do, whatever you say, and whatever approach you're taking, do your worst. We're still going to continue serving the Lord. Those are the people that will stand. And I pray you will stand. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren. As it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. And the charity, the love of every one of you all toward each other abounded, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God, for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endured. There was something to endure. Even at the time that Paul the Apostle was writing, to, they were still enduring it because they endure in the present tense. It came, it's coming, it's still coming, and you're still enduring. And that's, that's how we remain saved. But if you're saying, well, I will get saved when there are no more troubles, hey, there's a world. There are tribulations in the world. Trials in the world. There's going to be trouble in the world, but thank God God's grace is greater than that trial. God's grace is greater than the persecution. And because of that, you can stand, and you will stand in Jesus' name. And then it says there in verse 5, look at verse 5, which is a manifest token 
of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be accounted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Sin, it is a righteous sin with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Our own trial is temporary. The trial and the tribulation and the pressure and the, and the punishment of our persecutors will be eternal. I pity those uh, persecutors. I said I pity those persecutors. We will soon get out of it. When they get to hell, they'll never come out of it. Let's preach to them so they will not perish and those who believe will not perish in Jesus' name. In First Peter chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 12. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you. You know, those who are not prepared for this, it comes by surprise. And then it's like, why should this be happening to me? I'm born again. Why should this happen? I'm sanctified. Why should this happen? I'm faithful to the Lord. Why should this happen? That's what the Lord is saying. Don't count it as a strange thing. Unbelievers will act in unbelief. Sinners will sin. Evil people will do evil. And it works worse and worse. Graceless people will act without grace. Don't, accept, don't, ac don't expect a fish to fly. And don't expect a bird to swim. And don't expect a sinner to be holy. And don't expect a wicked man to act good. Wicked men will be wicked. Persecutors they are. They'll persecute. And whenever they do that, you just understand, okay, that's, that's a sinner there. He's just doing what his nature tells him to do. He cannot do better. And if you understand that, you'll never, never be taken by surprise. They will always be there. They're in the world. But we're going to stand. I said we're going to stand. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. Sorrowful are you? I said, are you sorrowful? If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, tell me the next thing. Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. Let none of you suffer as a thief. Let none of you suffer as an evil doer. Let none of you suffer as a busybody in other men's matters. What's the meaning of that? It says, if you are born again, you'll not be a murderer. If you're born again, you'll not be a thief. If you're born again, you'll not be an evil doer. If you're born again, you'll not be a busybody in other people's matters. Therefore, whatever suffering you have will not be like you're suffering because of abortion. You're suffering because you commit abortion for somebody else's wife or somebody else's daughter. And then it's not persecution, it's punishment for your murdering, for your, for your mother. And then it's as a seed. You're not suffering because you're a thief, because you're born again. And born again people don't steal, do they? No. Therefore, you'll not suffer as a thief. Or as an evil doer. Do born again people, do they do evil? No. If you are doing evil, you're not born again. Don't suffer as an evil doer. Or as a person that is prognosing to other people's affairs, other people's matters. As a busy body. In other people's matters, in their families, in their marriages, in their profession, in the things that belong to them privately, in their privacy. You are not a busybody if you are really born again. If you are a busybody, poke no sin, no, no sin everywhere. What's happening there? What's happening there? If, all, if that's all your interest, you're not born again. And then if people say, ah, you carried my secret to so and so. And then they punish you for that. You're not suffering as a Christian. You're suffering as a busybody in other men's matters. I pray that will not happen to you. Yet, in verse 16, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. I pray that God will help us to keep on standing. You know, the result that came to these Testament believers, it produced a change in their lives. 
And it's not, not only that they were saved, they were enabled to stand firm in the face of severe persecution. No one could doubt the genuineness and the reality of their conversion. By their steadfast endurance, they proved that the watch within the believer has more power than any pressure, any external force coming from without. God's word, when believed, will produce genuine salvation, sanctification, transparent, holy living, and true spirituality and courageous steadfastness during persecution. And it says, For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen. The persecution came from their own countrymen, close relations and neighbors and fellow citizens. They did not run away from, their, from the community or country because of the persecution. They stood firm. And when it comes to your turn, you stand firm. And as we're reading the testimony of the Tessian believers that persecution came and they stood firm, we'll read your own testimony and hear your own testimony that you too, you will stand firm on interrupted, unchanging, steadfast in the Lord. Or the persecution, whatever may come, you'll stand firm in Jesus' name. Because these believers they didn't run away. You know, there's some people that run away. They run away from the district. They run away from the group. They run away from the region. They run away from that state. I cannot stay there. The fire is too much. Hey, let grace come greater, higher than that fire of persecution. You'll stand in Jesus' name. I even hear of some pastors that run away from the pulpit. They say, I cannot bear that anymore. The persecution is too much. Hey, pastor, stay there. That's grace. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And God will make you stand. Some ministers that run away, missionaries that run away because of persecution. And they say, I don't know how I can stand here. It's too much. The, the fire, the persecution, the pressure. I don't know how I can stand this. You can stand. We will stand in Jesus' name. And no pastor will run away from the pulpit. And no missionary will run away from the mission field. And no preacher will run away from the preaching field in Jesus' name. And you will not run away from your district. You will stay there. Next time when you come, I will see you again. You say, Pastor, I stood, I stood, I stood firm. I'm here again. You'll always be there until Christ comes in Jesus' name. See, these believers they didn't allow a backslider to make them run away from the kingdom. A sinner to make them run away from the kingdom and from the appointment of the Lord for their lives. Whatever the Lord has appointed for you in your life, a backslider will not make you run away. A sinner will not make you run away. And a servant of Satan will not make you run away in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 35. Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, and look at that verse again. What has happened to you that is comparable to that verse? What have you seen? What persecution, trial have you got? What frownings of men have you experienced? What opposition have you experienced to compare with the tribulation, the distress, the persecution, the famine, the nakedness, the peril, the sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. Anybody persuaded there? Praise the Lord, we are persuaded. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no depths, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Give me a good amen. amen. Nothing and nobody will be able to separate you from the love of Christ in Jesus' name. 
I'm coming to point number three now. We're looking at the persecutor's full cup of sin and retribution. We're looking at uh, First Thessalonians chapter chapter two, verses fifteen and uh, sixteen. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse fifteen. Who both killed the Lord Jesus. Have you seen what those persecutors did? They killed the prince of life. And then it says, and their own prophets, and their own prophets, think about it. Those prophets were sent to them to help them, to open their eyes, to enlighten them, to direct them, to show them the way to heaven, to do good unto them. And these people, they, they didn't know that they were hurting themselves. It's like, you know, a passenger in the plane that wants to kill the pilot. He's going to die himself. It's like when the vehicle is in motion and a passenger in the vehicle goes to the driver and he says, I'm going to kill you. You kill yourself too. They need to understand. They killed their own prophets. They hindered. They are prophets from ministering unto them to prepare them for heaven. What foolishness that is. What madness that is. But that's what they did. And it says in verse 15, and I persecuted us. All we came to do is just to open their eyes, to show them the way of salvation, to tell them how the mercy of God can come to them, and to show them how salvation, eternal life can come to them, how they can get to heaven, how they can escape hell. That's what we came to do, to preach to them. And they're persecuting us. Persecutors are unreasonable. I pray you will be reasonable. And then it says, in, the, in verse 16, in verse 15, it says, They please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles, that they might be saved. What the word of God is saying here is that they themselves were not saved, number one. And then the other people that needed to be saved, they were a hindrance unto them. They were forbidding that these apostles and prophets and preachers will not preach the word of salvation, the word of conversion, the word of repentance, the word that will turn these people away from their sins and turn their face toward Jesus Christ, their Savior. They said, don't do that. And now it says in verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved to fill up their sins always. For the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. The wrath came upon them. The judgment came upon them. Indignation came upon them. And the eternal punishment came upon them because they didn't only reject or neglect their own salvation, they hindered the salvation of other people. Before I go on, is anybody here like that? That you are not born again? You're not on your way to heaven? And then our leaders, our preachers, our evangelists, our pastors, they're trying to show you the way to heaven. And yet you are hindering them from showing you. It's like a student that wants to go for an exam. And then there's a teacher dedicated to wanting to teach him to pass his exam. And he is hindering that teacher from teaching him. The teacher has got a certificate already. The teacher has a, a job doing already. And the teacher has a profession already. You are the one we're trying to prepare to get something in life. And you are hindering that same teacher that is to show you how to succeed. You hurt yourself. And then the people that are trying to hinder evangelists from preaching salvation to them, they hurt themselves. And then they also hinder from preaching to other people. It says to forbid. Can I just show you something in the word of God? Number one, there are people that forbid the salvation message. Look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. They forbid. Don't preach it. We charge you. We command you. Don't talk about that anymore. Look at Acts chapter 5 verse 27. And when they had brought them, they sent them before the council. And the high priest and asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. They said, They forbid them from 
preaching the word of salvation. Number two, uh, there are people that forbid evangelists and soul winners. And they say, you must not do that. We'll come back to First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 16. Forbidding evangelists. Forbidding soul winners. Uh, you know, there are some people that think their authority is more important than the salvation of our community. And they say, hey, we're here. You didn't come to take permission from us before you went to preach salvation to those people. You're not under authority. You're not standing on authority. You're not supposed to do anything. Even preaching to sinners, we're not supposed to do that except we give you permission. They forbid evangelists from evangelizing. So winners from serving souls. Look at that. First Thursday, chapter 2, verse 16. Forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved. Can I remind you that Paul had the voice of God from heaven and said, I send you to the Gentiles to go and show them the way of salvation. Open their eyes. And what God had told the man to do, these people, they wanted to have more authority than God to forbid him. Number three, would you know that there are people that forbid prayer meeting, night vigil, people are suffering, they have oppression, they have, they have whatever, and then some people are binding themselves together. Let's pray, because if we can pray without ceasing, with importunate prayer, this problem will be solved. The Lord will strengthen us. And some people forbid night vigil and prayer meeting. And they say, no, it cannot be done. Where does the Bible say that? No, that's just our tradition. We don't want it done. It must not be done. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 7. Forbidding prayer. And some people forbid prayer in their houses. They say, this is my house. And in my house here, wife, you cannot pray. In my house here, children, you cannot pray. In my house here, you cannot do this and that. They forbid prayer. We're looking at Daniel chapter 6 verse 7. All the presidents and all of the, of the kingdom, the governors and the princes and the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of the king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. Are you like that in the local church? You are sitting there like a great authority, an authority greater than God. And people wanted to come in there to pray. Say, no, we don't allow that here. But the Lord said, my house shall be called the house of, of prayer. And you forbid what God has ordained. Number four, you know there are people that forbid the Holy Ghost baptism and speaking in tongues. They said, no, it must not happen in their church. Anybody going to that place, you must not speak in tongues and you must not be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I'm looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They forbid Holy Ghost baptism. And that's our power. That's anointing. The anointing that breaks the yoke. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses something both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. And some people forbid that you should not have the power of the Holy Ghost. First Corinthians chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 39. Wherefore, brethren, covet uh, to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. There are some people forbidding people to speak with tongues. I pray they will not forbid you. I said they will not forbid you. When were you seeking for the Holy Ghost baptism? Those, uh, you know, many months ago, so many years ago. And then somebody came and said, hey, stop that. You know, people who speak in tongues, they get into trouble. And somebody can receive the uh, spirit of the devil. And then you stop the matter because somebody forbid you to speak with tongues. I pray you'll get back to it in Jesus' name. Other people, number five, they forbid marriage. I'm looking at First Timothy chapter, chapter 4. Sorry, First Timothy chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 1. First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. All this forbidding here, forbidding this one, forbid this doctrine of the devil. Forbidding salvation, doctrine of the devil. Forbidding evangelism, doctrine of the devil. And forbidding uh, Holy Ghost baptism, doctrine of the devil. For, forbidding fasting and prayer. And Jesus said... This kind goes not out except by prayer and fasting. 
And there are people that forbid fasting and prayer. It's of the devil. Look at verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 3. Tell me verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. I'm sure you know a particular denomination that they forbid their ministers and priests to get married. And you're reading in the news that fornication is being practiced. Instead of releasing their ministers to marry, they say, no, you cannot marry. You cannot marry. You stay like that. And they're committing fornication, immorality. And now it's coming out. And it's making morality to be practiced and promoted in such a church. The same thing if you are there and then you are forbidding people to marry. And then you prefer that they are committing sin in the secret so they can go to hell. You are not interested in their going to heaven. All you want is just not to marry and to stay like that and be hypocritical. The word of God has released you and he has said it's better to marry than to Born. Don't forbid it. Number six, the people that forbid casting out devils. And they say, hey, who are you? Are you among the prayer team? Are you among uh, coordinators? Are you among this and that? No, I'm not. Uh-huh. Who gave you the authority? Then? Don't do that again. But I see that as I pray for them, they get delivered. I said, don't do that again. They forbid casting out devils. I'm looking at Mark. I'm looking at Mark. Mark chapter 9. In Mark chapter 9, we're looking at verses 38 and 39. Mark chapter 9, verse 38. It says in verse 38, and John answered him, saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. He wasn't any magic or any occultism. He did it in the name of the Lord. We saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. It's not in our team, it's not in our group. It's not in a denomination. It's not a small inner circle. And because of that, we forbade him. Because he followeth not us. But Jesus said, forbid him not. Forbid him not. You need to examine your life. Maybe you forbid people from doing something they're doing that God wants them to do. Maybe you do that directly. Or you do that indirectly. To discourage them. To stop them. So they will not do what God has appointed them to do. And because you are not doing it, you see, they should not do it. Or maybe you are doing it and you think that you have the monopoly of doing that good thing. And the Lord is saying, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. Other people forbid water baptism. You are born again, you need to be baptized in water. It may be your father, your mother, they say no. You are baptized as an infant. Maybe a priest of a particular church, you are baptized as an infant. And the correct baptism after you are born again, they forbid it. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 10, verse 47. Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Can any man forbid water? That's what some people do. They forbid water. Can any man forbid water? That these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we... Do you know that other people forbid Bible reading and Bible study? I'm surprised. They say Sunday worship, that's enough. What else are you going to do? You know, if you read too much, that's what they say. If you read too much of that Bible, it turns your head. And somebody can become mad just reading the Bible. Have you heard that before? Some, some people say that. And they use that to forbid people reading the Bible, studying the Bible. Thank God you are here. I hope you'll keep coming. Keep okay, on going to the district and hearing the word of God and studying the Bible. It's beautiful to study the Bible. It's wonderful to study the Bible. Don't let anybody ever forbid you studying the Bible because that is a strength and the backbone of the believer. It makes you strong. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you know, sometimes they'll make fun of you while you're studying the Bible and they might, you know, show whatever kind of attitude they want to show. It's just to forbid you. You're studying too much of the Bible. We don't need all that too much. We have not done it enough. We are going to do more. 
I said, we're going to do more. Look at Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah chapter 36, I'm reading from verse 22. Now the king sat in the winter house in the nice month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass when Jehoda had read three or four leaves, he caught it with a pen knife, and he cast it into the fire, and that was on the hearth. And then it says, until all the roll, that's where the word of God was written, was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor wrenched their garments, neither the king, nor any of his servants, that heard all this was nevertheless El Nathan and Deliah and Gemariah had made intercession, pleading with the king that he would not burn the rule, but he would not hear them. The people that forbid reading the Bible, reading the word of God, studying the word of God. Number nine other people forbid building God's house. Have you thought about that? Or make an announcement in church and they were saying, well, we have this ramshackle place. It's not good enough. Let's build a God's house. Something befitting. And then some people say, we don't need that. That's okay for us. If they give us a primary school and we have those primary school benches to sit on, that's enough. What are we building church for? All these, you know, stately building and all that. But you don't talk about that. If you go to the bank and then the bank is in a ramshackle place, and you see the cashier there, you see primary school, a bench and chair. You don't want to deposit your money there. If you go to a court and then you see that that court, the judge is sitting somewhere there. And the bench is like, we don't know whether they have cleaned that thing for one year. You don't want to go to a court like that. If you go to any place and the place is not deep, how is it that it's the house of God that you forbid that they should build? Well, not forbid building the church of God will participate in building the church of God. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Haggai chapter 1. Haggai chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 2. Haggai chapter 1 verse 2. Thus speaketh the Lord of all, saying, the, the, These people say, The time is not come. The time that the house, that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lies waste? Your own city room is better than the church you are worshipping in. How good is that? Your own school, classroom, is better than the church you are worshipping in. How good is that? And the places you go with air condition, with everything there, everything is clean and neat. And then look at the place where you are worshipping. How good is that? And the Lord is saying, look at verse 6, Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, and ye have not enough. Ye drink, and ye are not filled with drink. Ye close you, ye and, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it in a, in a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, says the Lord. When we do what the Lord tells us to do and build a befitting sanctuary for the Lord, the Lord will bless us in Jesus' name. Other people forbid believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm looking at John chapter 9. John chapter 9, I'm reading verse 22. John chapter 9, verse 22. This word speak experience because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was the Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. They forbid people believing that Jesus is the Christ. Look at chapter 12, verse 42. Chapter 12, verse 42 of John. It says in verse 42, Nevertheless, among the chief priests also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. You see what the people do, how they forbid things in the world. How they forbid salvation. They forbid soul winning. They forbid prayer, fasting, 
night vigil. They forbid Holy Ghost baptism and speaking in tongues. They forbid marriage. And then they promote fornication and immorality. They forbid casting out devils. They forbid water baptism. They forbid Bible reading and Bible study. They forbid building God's house. They forbid believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says because of that, judgment comes upon them. I pray judgment will not come upon you. Then release the people then. Release your daughter. Release your son to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And release your wife to serve the Lord. Release your husband to serve the Lord. Release our preachers to say everything in their heart. Pour it out. Release your pastors to pour out their heart. The word of salvation without any hindrance and without trying to forbid those preachers and pastors that they have the freedom to say everything they plan to say. So that you're not being the, among the group of people forbidding the leaders and the ministers and pastors and preachers to preach the word of God with all freedom. Because if you do, judgment will come upon you. I'm coming back now to First Thessalonians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 13. In this passage, we see different kinds of people. Number one, we see the believers, sincere believers. Number two, we see the people that are persecutors. And then number three, we see the people that are forbidding other people to get saved. And they do it directly without even covering their mouth or covering their face. Which group do you belong? Let me read to you verse 13. For this cause also, thank we God without ceasing because when you received the word of God ye, that he had of us, you received it not as not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. That's a group of people. That's where I want to belong. I said that's where I want to belong. Number two, for ye brethren became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea I Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered the like things of your own countrymen, even as they, as they have of the Jews, which both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us. And please not God, and are contrary to all men. Those are persecutors, I will not be in that group. I said I will not be in that group. Group number three, forbidding us. Forbidding us. Forbidding the preaching of salvation. Forbidding soul winning. Forbidding prayer. Forbidding Holy Ghost baptism and power. Forbidding marriage. Forbidding casting out devils. Forgive, uh, forbidding water baptism. Forbidding Bible study, Bible reading. Forbidding building the house of God. Something befitting the worship of the house of the, of the Lord. And forbidding believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not forbid anybody from doing good. Are not in anybody from getting to heaven and doing what the Lord has called him to do. Which group do you want to belong to? The group of believers, the group of persecutors, and the group of the people that are contrary to the good of the church of the living God. Which one do you belong to? Believers, rise up and tell the Lord. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And tell the Lord, oh Lord, I want to serve you. I want to serve you. And whatever the persecution, whatever the opposition, I want to stand. Stand on the truth of the word of God. I said everybody should stand. I'm surprised for those who are still sitting down. And ushers should help us. We're here to obey the word of God. We're not here to rebel. When you hear this word of God, you should take it to heart. When you rebel against the teaching, you're trying to forbid the preacher from saying what you ought to say. Let's pray that the Lord himself will write the word in our hearts. We've learned much today that the Lord himself, by spirit, by his power, will make us obedient to the word. That's why we came here to study. So that the word can make us wise unto salvation. Not wise unto stubbornness.
pray that this word that has come out will enrich your Christian life. Break down every barrier. Pray that the Lord will help you to have genuine conversion. Prepare you for heaven. That will be like the Thessalonian believers that had the word and they knew that the word was not of human origin. Came from heaven. Revelation. Inspiration. Pray to change your character, change your lifestyle, change your conduct, change your attitude, change your behavior. That your salvation will be real. Conversion that has foundation. Life that has foundation. Conviction that has foundation. Decisions that have foundation. Marriage that has foundation. Service that has foundation. Sanctification that has foundation. That your foundation will be rooted in the word of God. That the word of God you hear, you exalt it above the opinions of all men, above your poets, above your philosophers, above your scientists, above your kings, above any man. That this word will give you strength to live. Power to live in righteousness. Power to live in holiness. It's through that word we're converted. It's through that word we're born again. It's through that word we're sanctified. It's through that word we're made holy. It's through that one we're able to live consistently in righteousness and holiness all the days of our lives. Pray that you remember the word when temptation comes, when trials come, when persecution comes, when opposition comes, you remember the words that you have learned. That word will make you steadfast, stable, solid. A real, real, real Christian. Living by the word, standing by the word, acting by the word, believing the totality of the word. Pray that the Lord will help you. That will stand immovable. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night and observe to do all that is written therein. Will not turn to the right or turn to the left, but will do all that you are learning. But then you'll make your way prosperous.
And only then you'll have good success. Pray that as you go back home, this word will keep on ringing in your heart, in your ears. Pray that as you go back to your offices, this word will keep on ringing in your ears. As you go back to your family, this word will keep on ringing in your ears. The word of salvation, the word of sanctification, the word of holiness, the word of purity. Keep on ringing in your life. Keep in the narrow path that leads to heaven. Canceling all rebellion, canceling all, all disobedience, canceling all stubbornness, making you to stand to live according to the word. And pray that you'll not suffer as a murderer, as a thief. As a busy body in other men's matters, be serious, devoted, committed, consecrated, unbending, unyielding, uncompromising Christian. Pray that the grace of God will increase in your life, that the righteousness of the Lord will be reproduced in your life. That everywhere you go, you'll be able to stand on this unchanging word, unchanging truth. Living by the standard of the word and keeping to the standard of the word. And pray that you'll not be among the people forbidding others. To get saved. Forbidding repentance. Forbidding restitution. Forbidding righteousness. Forbidding others to believe in holiness. Forbidding others to believe in sanctification. That you not be among the people. That will forbid. Other people from soul winning. You will not stand as a hindrance, as a stumbling stone, for people who want to win souls, want to be preachers, want to be missionaries, that you will not be the one standing in their way, forbidding them. Pray that that kind of spirit of the Antichrist. be taken away from your life. You will not be among the people forbidding prayer, forbidding fasting, forbidding night vigil, forbidding people be strong in prayer and strong in faith. You will be among the people encouraging people to pray. Encouraging preachers to preach. Encouraging evangelists to win souls. You know, be among the people standing in their way. Pray that that spirit that will forbid, forbid other people from being baptized in the Holy Ghost, forbid them from speaking in tongues, that kind of spirit will not be you. Standing in other people's ways to have the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives. Pray that you yourself be filled, saturated with the spirit of power, anointing, unction. Then you'll be an encouragement to the people that want revival in the Holy Ghost. Pray that you'll not be among the people hindering others getting married, forbidding them to get married, encouraging secret sin, 
encouraging fornication, immorality. Pray that God will help you. You're not turn the church to a denomination. Denomination of forbidding people to do right. Forbidding people to take the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion. Discouraging them, hindering them, talking to them. You'll be among the people, encouraging people, empowering them, preparing them to take the Lord's Supper. You'll not be among those who are discouraging Bible reading, Bible study. You be among those who encourage, who get people interested, excited. You be among the people that make Bible study time joyful time, exciting time, a time of happiness, a time of growth, a time of spiritual enlightenment. You know, be among the people that make Bible study time such time, sorrowful time. Be among those who encourage, among those who make Bible study time exciting. Pray that the Lord will help you. You'll be an encouragement. Not a discouragement. That God will help you. You'll not be among those who forbid good things. You'll be among those who encourage good, good things. For kingdom citizens. Be like the Thessalonian believers. Receive the word and let the word work effectually in you.